Picture this. You've just raised a $24 million seed round from investors, and it's time to start growing your team that you started at zero. Fast forward a year and you're doing well. You're almost 450 people now. Now you're getting a $100 million Series A in 2021 with a goal to spend it in two years. But wait, the tech crisis hits in 2022. What do you do as a chief product officer? If this sounds like an interesting story of growth to you, you're going to love today's episode with Alex Watrelos, who's the former chief product officer of Sunday, a restaurant payment solution. Alex and I dive into his lessons learned going through intense growth and downsizing, which he now brings to his new job as chief product officer at Furious, the online system that integrates the business's CRM, quotes, billing, and project management. But before we bring Alex on, it's time for today's Dear Melissa. In this segment, you can ask me all of your burning product management questions, and I answer them every single week. If you want to submit your questions, go to dearmelissa.com and let me know what's on your mind. Also, if you leave me a voicemail, I do prioritize those. So let's go to today's caller. Hi, Melissa. I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a product manager for a government contracting company. I've been in the product space for 15 years, so I certainly have a plethora of experience in new startups, growth stage startups, as well as Fortune 200 enterprise product companies. I am a product manager on the contract that I am assigned, however, not for the greater company, which does not have a product function. It came to my attention that we do have technologists who are creating products for our greater company. We don't have product management function or even an infrastructure to support these products. I know the value of them is also non-traditional. For example, it just might bolster a bid for a new contract or lower an implementation cost, but it might not be the only reason that a contract is won or lost. We will never be a product-led company. However, we are a services company that is supported by products, and I'm curious if you have any advice for this setup. I pitched with success for our organization to think about hiring a director or a VP of product to lead these product efforts. But when I think about measuring the success of these products or trying to understand ROI, I'm falling a bit flat. Any thoughts? All right. So the situation that you're in is very much like a couple different types of companies. Uh, you, it sounds like you're doing a little bit of consulting and you're using technology on the back end to help create more leverage and bolster up your company. A lot of businesses are in a similar situation. You can think of them as software-enabled companies. You don't necessarily just sell the software, which is SaaS. What you're doing here is you're streamlining the way that you deliver your product, or you're trying to put more value around the services that you actually deliver. So if you think of things like banks or pharmaceutical companies, they don't necessarily just sell software. They sell other things like financial instruments. You sell services. What you're doing with your technology there is uh, very similar to that, right? It's using it to streamline the way that you work. It could be to reduce costs. It could to uh, be to create more valuable things that you can do through services for your team. So there's actually a lot of consulting companies out there that are starting to build technology that helps their consultants function better. I know McKinsey is doing this for a fact. They have a whole platform that their consultants can use. I think they're actually selling that platform now to clients as well. Um, but in that case, it got started first for streamlining internal operations, making their consultants a little bit more powerful, and now it's something that they can actually sell to their clients. You might wanna think about your products the same way. So if you're thinking about it as, hey, what do we do to add a little bit more value here? You can also start to think about how your business creates value. So you create value by delivering services. How can the software that you build deliver better services, differentiated services, services in a faster time? All those types of things could provide value for the customer. And even though they are not necessarily just paying for the software, they pay for that package as a value add, right? Software allows you to do things that you weren't able to do before. So there's still ROI invested in that, right? There's still value that's going to come from that. It might not just be one-to-one, -one, but you can start to compare it to what, it, what would we do if we didn't have this, right? What would we be able to sell it for? How much would it cost to deliver these services? What can we do now with our product? And that's how I would back that out into financials. So in this situation, it doesn't matter if you're just selling software. You can still add a lot of value to your services and to your industry and your business if you build software that produces more value for both you internally and for your customers. So think about it that way. You might wanna start by looking at it from a cost reduction perspective that's totally fine. Or you might look at it and say, hey, this is something that we can put onto a bid that really provides value to our customers as well. 
doesn't really matter, but think of it as a whole package there and what you want to build to get that done and how it affects the value that you deliver, how it affects the revenue for your business and the cost for your business. And just because software is a piece of the package doesn't mean it's less valuable. If you think about a credit card at a bank, you would never get a credit card that you cannot manage through an app or an online system. But I don't necessarily buy that online system from the credit card company, right? From the bank. So think about it that way. Like it's a package. And because all of these things are packaged together, it's a more valuable package than if we just did one alone. That's how I would back it out and start to think about it. In this case, product management is still important. You do need somebody to look at the holistic piece of all the products that you're looking at. Somebody like a VP of product and say, what value do we want to provide with our software? Is it a cost play? Is it a revenue play? Is it a value add play? How do we package it? How do we think through these things? That's where product management becomes really important. So I hope that helps answer your question. And again, for those of you listening, if you have a question for me, go to dearmelissa.com and let me know what it is. I will answer it on an upcoming episode. Now it's time to welcome Alex to the show. Welcome, Alex. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. And I'm super happy to be here. So I'm really excited to talk about your story as a chief product officer of Sunday. And it's a great growth story. I'm wondering, can you orient our listeners towards Sunday and, you know, tell us about what it looked like when you joined and where it got to? All right. So so just for the, you know, for the context, Sunday is a company that it's a fintech company. And what we built was a, a small Essentially, the initial product was a QR code you would put on the table that people could scan so they could pay the bill without having to wait for the waiter. Um, and that was supposed to, uh, or is supposed to, because, because the company's still there, right? Of course, uh, move into the, the, the broader field of, of B2C payments, uh, B2C to B2B payments. Um, so when I joined, I joined at the very, very, very beginning of Sunday when Sunday was just, just an idea and, and you know, worked with uh, Victor Luguer and Christine de Vendel, so the two co-founders uh, of Sunday. Uh, on the slide deck, essentially on the pitch deck, uh, raised 24 million uh, seed round uh, to launch a product and, and build a team. Uh, and we scaled very, very fast, raised another 100 million in Series A roughly six months later. And we scaled within two years to 450 people, uh, including 25 PMs and 130 engineers. So very, very hardcore and, and, and fast growth uh, during that time. By then, we're in 2022. Uh, of course, tech crisis happened. We had, unfortunately, to, to massively downscale, but the, the vision and the idea hasn't changed. And so, you know, uh, Sunday is still uh, alive and kicking, uh, doing its best to, to change payments in the, in the hospitality world. That is so much growth over such a short period of time, going from zero to 450. When I was at a, a, a company, we went from zero to 150 in 18 months, and I thought that was a lot. I can't even imagine 450 people Tell us about the challenges, you know, being a chief product officer, growing like that. What were some of the things that you had to deal with and consider in that time? I mean, obviously, the, you know, the biggest challenge you have when you grow is noise. <laughs> like, there's just so much noise happening from everywhere, from, from within your teams, because they're constantly disrupted. They need to constantly change their scope and speed the scope again and, and you know, bring in new people, onboard new people to, uh, you know, the teams you have on, on the side, right? So, 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 you know, the ops or the sales and whatnot, because they have the same problems as you. Plus you need to interact with them. And, you know, before you had 1 PM talking to one sales guy and the, 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 the next day you have 1 PM team talking to one sales team, right? And that's, that's very different and you have very different dynamics. So, um, and obviously the noise from the investors, the noise from, you know, everyone expecting so much. And also, you know, uh, during that time, we also launched in 10 countries. So within two years. So that's also, you know, a ton of noise because you have a ton of partners, you have a ton of, of different customers and, 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 you know, you need to make, uh, you need to make sense uh, and understand, you know, what, what are the undercurrents, uh, be, be behind that noise and, and what can you, what are the opportunities you can leverage and which one should you just let go for the moment because you don't have time. So I'd say that's the number one problem. The number two problem or challenge actually is is hiring people <laughs> when, when you when you need to hire that fast you essentially double your size every three months uh and uh and it's 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 quite painful and, and so essentially my calendar would be at the very minimum 15 to 20 hours of hiring per week uh just just hiring people uh because not only do you need to hire but you need to hire very very good people 
if you want to them to have any level of autonomy and proactivity in such a level of growth, because you cannot handhold people's uh, hands uh, when you're going through such a such a such a growth phase. So essentially, I would say these are the two biggest challenges: it's the amount of noise and making sense of you know what are the true insights that are hidden uh, behind that noise. And the second one is you know hiring the right team uh, for your job because it's a it's a big job uh, to be done. Yeah, two two very challenging things right there. Let's dive into the first one a little bit with the noise. That's something really common that I hear um, and I've seen working with growth stage companies, right? Like there's a million decisions you have to make. There's so many new people coming in. How do you, how did you concentrate, right? Like how what did you choose to focus on? And then reflecting back on this period of time, is there anything that you would have done differently? No, <laughs> I would do everything differently. But uh, um, so 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 you know what did we do right, and then what the you know let's see let's see what we could have improved, but. I think the first thing we did right was to really have an MVP kind of mindset and, and not trying to understand, you know, what is going to be our product exactly in what kind of features in the next five years, but really what is the value prop we want to bring and how can we test that and validate that as fast as, as, fast as we can uh, on the market. And, and once you really understand what you want to bring, well, it's much easier to make choices because bottom, bottom line is with 450 uh, people and 130 engineers, you can build a lot of things that are interesting to a lot of people, right? And so for that, um, and maybe that brings me to the first thing I, I should have done better. Um, the best thing is to have a strong vision. Uh, if you have a strong, clear vision, product vision and product strategy, um, then it's very easy to figure out what is it you're building next. And and that's something, I'm not totally sure why I, I, I felt at it, but we had a vision, we had a clear vision um, in terms of company vision. But then when it came to, to the product vision and especially strategy, I really struggled to come up with, you know, the simple thing of where we are today, where we're going, what is the path to get there? And, you know, in, in, in what sequence, in what order? And, and somehow I never could wrap my head around it. And I think one of the mistakes I've done is, is, is linked to that noise and speed and the reason that is required of you in that time, which is, I think, I guess, whenever I try to do something around strategy, I would just block an afternoon and I would try to come up with strategy, which obviously doesn't work because <laughs> you need a lot more time to do a strategy. So I, I, I built a lot of strategies, <laughs> but none of them were complete enough or good enough to actually really help us. So I think that's something really I wish uh, I, I could go back in time and actually like change it and make it, uh, make it a lot more powerful and a lot more useful. So I think that's, that's, that's one strong thing uh, I would change if I were to go back in time. You um, bring up a, a good point here too that I see a lot of companies create this company vision, but when it comes to a product vision, sometimes they, they lack it. Uh, and then the, there's this whole conversation about what is the right level of product vision, right? Some of them, I see them be like extremely wishy-washy. Like we want to help solve this problem, but we don't say how, right? Or or we want to be the best bank, right? Like, or we, we want to have the best mobile app. Like that's not not refined well. When you go back and reflect and, and look at this product vision, how what do you think is the right level of product vision? Like how would you describe a good product vision here? And, and maybe even like how you, you thought through it and came up with it. And how does that compare back to the company vision? Like, how did you make sure that it was not so high level that we're playing in company territory, but it was enough to get your teams going yeah. and, and provide direction? I think, I think the, um, so, so, so the main thing is, because I, I was lucky enough uh, after Sunday to, to do a couple of, of mentoring of, of, of different C, C level uh, and, and, you know, help them on that topic. And, and what really worked uh, somehow I managed to do strategies for many companies, just not mine. <laughs> that was a, that's a shame. Uh, but you know, it's never too late to learn. Uh, and so, and so what really worked well is again, you know, like, so what is our company vision? And then what I would define as a vision is what is the, the company vision is essentially, how do you change the world? Uh, how is the world different because of, you know, your mission and what you're doing in there? And then your product vision is what is the product that enables that world to be different? What is essentially what, what is it essentially you're bringing? And here, you you want something that is precise enough so that you're sure that if you have that product, the world is indeed different. The world is indeed uh, 
you know, the world you've described in your, in, in your vision. So you, you need some precise statements that, you know, can somehow easily be verified. If you, if you have a product and you have your product vision and you can easily say, we're there or we're not there yet. And this, these are the reasons. So that's, that's fine going enough. But what you definitely don't want is you definitely don't want to start to say it's a web app or it's a mobile app or it's a, these are, these are things you don't want. You want to say what the product does, what, what are its users, how they, how they interact with it. And then what do they get out of it? That's what you want to describe, but you don't want to say the what, because the what you have no clue. Uh, and that's the, you know, you, you need to acknowledge the fact that you don't know what, uh, what the, the what will be. So how do we balance this? Cause I feel like this is a big topic for, for a lot of people, right? Like how do we balance this? And I agree with like, don't say it's a web app or a mobile app, but what I found is saying things like we're a platform, right? Or we're an open platform might like, might be helpful. I'm trying to figure out where would you draw the line there between being too like prescriptive about the solution versus, um, you know, giving enough direction so that people can tangibly understand what you're building towards. It's, it's been a, it's, it's tricky for me even. And no. like, I, I go back and forth on this. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Because what I've seen is that if it's if it's not if you're not calling out kind of how you think about the product manifesting, yeah. the it becomes the company vision almost right. Like if you only talk about value, if you only talk about like customer segments um, and problems we solve, it's almost too similar. So like where where would you refine that company vision into something more tangible? I guess you know it, <laughs> the tricky part is it depends on the size of the company. When you're Uber or when you're Apple you can go a lot wider and broader and fluffier because <laughs> your means are so much more than if you're a startup or a scale-up. What I believe is the product vision needs to describe the service you're offering. And, and it, it's really about that, is what is the service you're offering? Whether you're offering it as a platform or as you know another way, in the end, is not really that relevant. But what are people able to do or able to get? And who are these people? But who are these people and what are they able to get through you, I think is the right level of product vision. Like you need to describe what is the benefit of your product, but not really what that product is. This is up for discovery. Okay. And when you're like putting together, because Sunday was, you know, early stages, you're obviously out there testing. How, how are you balancing like crafting that product vision versus getting feedback from customers in real time? Because like, as you said at the beginning, you're going zero to 25. So we're starting with... Yep not a lot of stuff <laughs> and then we're, we're building it now with the seed round of money what was your way of kind of going out learning from your customers figuring out how that vision manifests and what you do to yeah. keep it updated and keep the teams in the loop so so at Sunday what we know we want to do and you know what we knew already at the time is we wanted to make payments as seamless as online like physical payments retail payments as seamless as online uh, and, and and we knew we would start in the restaurant industry, because we knew there was a big pay point. We knew it's, a, you know, especially in Europe, in the US, it's a bit better. Payment experience is a bit better. But what you have to understand is in Europe, the payment experience is, is, is often terrible in a restaurant. Like you, you're waiting at a table, you have a wonderful dinner, and then at some point you decide to, to, to pay. And then you're spending the next 15 minutes not talking to the person in front of you, but trying to grab the waiter's attention, get the bill. And then somehow pay, and that take that takes so long, and that really like kills the mood of the evening. And so, and so we're like, this is a great way of getting into fintech, getting in this interface between B two C and B two B payment, physical ones, and getting people to pay with us. So we knew where we wanted to start, and we knew where we wanted to end. And we didn't really have the path towards it. Like we knew, like after restaurants, there could be hotels, or there could be. Uh, you know, cabs or whatever, you know, there's many ways. We didn't know really the path, but we knew we had a great starting point because we identified the pain, the pain point. And, and, you know, during the MVP, what we saw is we had 60% of the users paying with the, uh, with our app rather than paying, you know, through the standard payment terminal. So we actually validated that this is something that can work. This is something that is actually appealing to people. So to go back to your question is how did we balance vision and and, and, you know, trying getting feedback from users. I, I would not say I did a fantastic job at it again, you know, to, to go back to, to what we said, but I think bottom line, what worked well is we really, really, really focused on where we were today. We knew we could start there. We had validated through the MVP that it was a good starting point. 
And then we just focused on making that thing better because bottom line is we knew if you want to enter the fintech world, you can't enter it doing everything at once. Some, some companies have done it, but in very different contexts. If you take um, Alipay or WeChat Pay, so, you know, the Chinese QR code payments companies, um, or even Venmo or everything, what, what these companies have done to spread is mostly targeting the unbanked. Uh, so, you know, they, they target people who don't have access to the financial system in the same way that European people do. Uh, Europeans, European payment system is fairly democratic in a way, as in it's accessible to almost everyone. Almost everyone can have a bank account and a credit card, except for very, very few people. Uh, and so you can't have that, you know, one size fit all kind of play, right? You need to start somewhere. And we found a great place to start where we could actually, and, you know, getting back to your question, get a lot of feedback for users. The reason for that is Victor Luger, who is the CEO of our company, is also the CEO of um, and founder of, of, uh, of uh, the Big Mama Group, which is essentially a restaurant group, uh, one of the big restaurant groups in Europe. And so from the start, we had this fantastic chance of actually being able to every single time we would have something, develop something, have an idea, being able to test there. And we still have that chance, actually. So, so bottom line is we knew of the place where we wanted to start. The MVP confirmed it was good enough. We knew of our vision, and then we didn't focus so much on the vision. We focused really much on just making that thing work that we knew could work, making it work in as many restaurants and as many countries as fast as possible. And so, you know, user feedback was more important than, than vision, I would say, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the startup. There's two things I really wanted to dive in there because I thought they were interesting about. Like, one, that idea of the partnership that you were just mentioning. Like, we have a place that we can go test, and we could still go test there whenever. Uh, how... So first question, how critical was that? And how should companies that are starting out think about building, especially B2B companies, think about building those relationships? And how how did you build that relationship before you had a product even to like be able to go in and start testing it? So, I mean, we, again, we were super lucky just because the, you know, our CEO was also the founder of, of that other company. So bottom line, we didn't have to build many relationships. Of course, we had to build you know, good human relationship to the people there, right? And, and, and you know, like not all, all the time rely on the CEO, but but bottom line is it was pretty easy uh, to get there and test. So we were very lucky in a way. Um, but indeed, it was so incredibly valuable. As soon as we started, you know, having a product worked on the pay at table thing, we started wanting to expand. So, you know, the question is, do you want to expand in, in, in adding ordering to your app or do you want to expand in adding loyalty or, or review or, or, or whatever else, right? And all these things, instead of building, you know, something that would work for everyone, we could always build something that just worked just for them with their branding, with their colors, with their everything, you know, not, nothing that is customizable because, you know, we just had to essentially add a, an HTML page, right, to, to our web app. And that was it. And we could test and we could see if people would actually use the review module or if people would use the loyalty program or if people would use or not use the ordering, uh, the ordering bar or even build a fake door tests. Right. So, you know, and that was also very easy to manage because, you know, we were in direct contact with these people. So I'd say that should be focus number one. Um, and, and the reason for that is I think, uh, uh, you know, when you think 30 years back, companies were not good at testing things. They would never test things. Today, everyone's super aware of the need for good discovery. And now we almost see the opposite as in startups being super young, pre-product market fit and wireframing everything, prototyping everything and, and, and giving it to people in the streets, trying to see what's their reaction. But I'm like, it doesn't always work. Sometimes the best test is just on your live product. For example, especially if you're doing a payment product, like someone interesting, interacting on the wireframe where it's not their money, is not a proper use test. Like a proper user test is someone paying, giving a tip on your app, you know, and whether they, they give 22% or 25% matters, matters a lot. And it will be a different reaction, whether it's their money or some wireframe, uh, Figma wireframe that you're sending them. So I think bottom line is, that is why it's so important to have customers you can test with and have good relationship is when you're, when you're startup, when you scale up and your pre-product market fit are young enough, like you cannot wireframe everything. You cannot prototype everything. You need someone uh, where you can test live uh, in and test on your product directly. I, I think that's a really nice point. People get very confused about MVPs and I've been talking about MVPs for 10 years and I've heard every definition about it. Um, and I've always encouraged people to try to do something in a low code or no code way. 
But to me, people are misunderstanding the purpose of an MVP if they're not starting from where you're talking about. Like, where does the value actually happen? Like, what's the what's the the thing the user needs to do to prove this is actually valuable? And in the case for you, it's like actually paying. And when your money's not on the line, you can't get the right feedback. So how do you think about mitigating risk so that you're not going out there building this entire like crazy payment app, right? Or how did you mitigate risk, right? Um, and not knowing if people would pay on it. Like what what steps do you take to de-risk that situation and make sure that you don't go below a bunch of money? The very first MVP of Sunday uh, was built with two developers in three weeks. That's a very low risk. Uh, that, that's a very low risk. And that is where we confirmed it was absolutely terrible and, and, and full of bugs and missing a ton of things. Uh, but that's where we confirmed that in a restaurant where we control, you know, we control the speech of the waiters and we control, we controlled everything, but yet in a restaurant, we could reach next day one, 60% of the payments in that restaurant with the most terrible product you could think of. And so, and so. Once we had that, we're like, these numbers are that good, 60%, like Apple Pay is not even there in Europe. Like Apple Pay is maybe at 30% um, out of the iPhone users, right? Not of, out of the whole market. So, so, so <laughs> getting to these numbers on the most terrible product ever told us there's something and there's something we can do. Uh, and so I would say from there on, uh, risk was not so much more a, a big topic. It was more, we don't have time. We don't have enough time, and, and so we need to we need to speed up. We need to speed up. We need to speed up. Obviously, this was also emphasized by the fact that you know we had very strong VC back, backing with a lot of money uh, behind, and the relationship to risk was very different in 2020, 2021 than it is today. Right? Like today, when you think about risk, you think about hey, like just don't don't crash the company, don't lose the money. Right? Uh, at the time. People were much more willing to see 10x, 100x, uh, 1,000x uh, multiples. Uh, I mean, not multiples, but actually, like you know, how your valuation should evolve. Um, and then it's okay if 10, 10, nine out of 10 uh, actually crash. So I'd say that's that. It's like the very first MVP cost almost nothing and confirmed that both B two C and B two B players were able to use it in a very strong, purposeful fashion. The other things we saw as well is like not only the usage, but also the value behind it. What we saw is we saw that we would rotate the tables, um, you know, essentially a quarter, uh, quarter an hour faster. Uh, for a restaurant, that means everything because a restaurant has around 10% uh, margin, 10% EBITDA on, 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 on their tables. But every additional table you sell is 80% margin. The reason for that is you've already paid your rent, you've already paid your waiters, uh, you've already paid almost everything, right? And so every single additional dish, every single additional table that you can you can serve uh, is a ton of margin that you're you're bringing into your restaurant. And so when you speed up table rotation, for example, uh, by a quarter an hour is quite a lot. Um, then you you actually make a lot a lot more profit than than you would without without the product. So that these are you know we saw a ton of numbers. We also saw, saw that uh, we were doubling tips with uh, the the most the most uh, you know the most terrible kind of product. Not doubling tips in the US, right? Obviously, like uh, we didn't go to 3% tips. <laughs> but in Europe, you know, in Europe, it's like 2 to 3% tips. And we would say that we would do uh, double as that uh, with the product. And so, you know, all these things told us there's a ton of value here and we can really move forward aggressively. And the only thing we don't have is time. So that is then, you know, every time we would try something like this review loyalty program and everything, time was the key factor in our mind. It's like, how can we try? the fastest something so that we know whether we drop it or we don't drop it. One of the things that I like about these stories too, and I feel like this this is this is a there's a lot of corporations out there, let's say, that really want to work like a startup. And what I tell them is that time factor, right? And the fact that you will run out of money one day is the thing that makes startups scrappier. Um, but the one key thing I think that's really hard sometimes for product managers starting out in that organization or in a larger organization is thinking about what I call like thin slicing. I know like Alistair Coburn calls it like carpaccio when it comes to development stuff. But it's like, how do we how do we think about what's the minimum that we can get out there and have test and get the right experience without going away for like six months and building this huge fully fledged feature and get it out. So 
Um, and that comes from like a technical perspective, but also a product perspective, right? Like starting from the product experience and figuring out what's the minimum and then going back and figuring out what you can do on the technical side to actually make it happen. Uh, and your story, I think, is a great story that demonstrates that like MVP thin slicing scenario here where it's not just, you know, where we were testing that people will pay, right? It didn't matter that it had every feature in the world here. We're just testing that people would pay. As you went on from that MVP and started to think about how do things get out there faster, how did you like encourage yourself and the team to start thinking about what you could de-scope, right? Like what didn't have to go into that version, what you could actually get out to customers faster? Every time you want to think of a, an MVP thing, like you first, you know, you first do your documents and you write down whatever you want. And then you say, okay, the MVP is that. And then you can literally go back there 24 hours later and say, what can I remove? And you can already remove that three quarter of the work. And if you do that again, you again, we're going to remove 75% of the work. And I think bottom line is what I told my PMs is like, don't come up with an MVP plan without having spent three days removing stuff from it. Like really three days, you take an hour and you remove everything you can remove. And you don't do that alone. You do that with your, uh, your, your engineering manager or, you know, a dev, you know, is interested in the topic or, or the, you know, a sales guy that, that actually knows uh, quite a bit about that market, that product or anything like don't do it on your own, like do it, do it with other people. But I think the, the most crucial thing is just come back to it enough times so that your mind is able to reset. And you're able to, again, re-challenge, do I really need to do that? And, uh, and in the end, you end up with extremely minimal MVP where you realize, you know, like you need to make, for example, like I'll give an example of my current company. Uh, my current company has this problem or this problem. Uh, we have some, we have somewhere where we can edit, uh, some, uh, some PDF documents. Um, and most companies want to edit, to edit the, the template of it, uh, the PDF template so that it looks like their brand. And this is extremely time consuming for our support because we need to help them a ton. And, and so what we did, what I told them is now, uh, we're just going to put, it costs 200 euro, uh, if you want to, the support to help you, uh, on that topic. People are like, ah, but now we need to build a paying, uh, payment engine and everything. I was like, no, we don't build a payment engine. We just say we're going to take them 200 euros. We're never going to take them 200 euros. But people, people that don't believe it's worth 200 euros for them will never click on that button or never ask us to help edit the template because they don't want to pay. And the people who, who, for who it is worth 200 euros or more, guess what? We are happy to help them. And that's an MVP. And bottom line is, you know, in the future, if I still have too much demands, then maybe I'm going to build for it. I'm going to, I'm going to you know, set up some organi some, someone in my organization that just does that uh, or, or whatever we'll see. But right now, I don't, I don't build the people. I just tell them it's, it, costs, it costs that much money. And for the people whose you know, value is less than that, well, they don't ask me anymore. And I have less work and I've solved my problem. That's a great, I like that story a lot. I think that's a really good mentality for thinking about it. The other thing I was thinking about earlier that you said is that you guys chose as one of your strategies to expand geographically as fast as possible, which is which is a hard strategy. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, hard, hard really is a nice is. way to put it. Yeah, uh, reckless yeah, so is another way. <laughs> what made you What made you decide to like off the bat do that first? Like it was like we're going to expand geographically. Like this is the this is the motion we want to choose. So initially, what we did is we we went. Uh, you know, when we raised the, 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 the seed round, we went US, France, Spain, and the UK. Uh, France, Spain, and UK, because we had physical presence there with the restaurants uh, company that I've mentioned. And the US, because, well, the US is just such a fantastically attractive market. And, uh, you know, if you take an example, a restaurant, uh, a restaurant, a big restaurant in France uh, has around $1 million to $2 million turnover. A big one in the U.S. has 10 to 15 million dollar turnover. So, you know, when you suddenly so it's easier to compensate your CAC uh, when when closing a, a U.S. restaurant than when closing a French one. Um, so, so you know, we went we went U.S., Spain, France, and U.K. And so the reason was we were strong in three countries, and the last one is the U.S., which is an absolutely dominating country in terms of market and market size, and also you know a very you know. Tech savvy, uh, tech savvy uh, 
market, which is important when you go to the restaurant industry because the restaurant industry is ages behind uh, in terms of digitizations. And then, you know, we had fantastic growth numbers, like really, really, really strong numbers. And, and that led us to, 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 to raise 100 million Series A. And when we did that, then, you know, the deal at the time when you would raise money was you need to spend that in, you know, two years or whatever, a year and a half. <laughs> it was just like, please burn it, make more growth, and then we are going to raise more money. And, you know, we're just going to keep going like this until, you know, we rule the world. And once you rule the world, you'll make money, don't worry. Uh, and so, and so, you know, then we're like, okay, what do we do with that money? Do we do more products or do we do more countries? And and more countries, we did more products, but more countries felt easier. And and because still payments habits are fairly similar, they're quite a bit different between the US and Europe, but within Europe, they're still fairly standard. And we felt we had a product that could actually easily scale. And, and opening country was actually not that hard uh, and we managed it fairly well. I'd say the, the, the thing we underestimated there was, although the, um, you know, the habits of payments are similar, the, um, the market are different. Exactly what I, what I mentioned about, you know, the difference between the big restaurants in France and the big restaurants in the US, uh, a restaurant in Portugal is extremely small. So in Portugal, we could, for example, very easily sell to tons of restaurants, but every single restaurant is very small. So just, you know, um, the costs of, of acquiring that restaurant and setting it up and connecting to the POS and whatnot was very, very hard to offset. And we, we need to do fantastic uh, penetration adoption numbers uh, within uh, within this restaurant to actually like offset the cost of, of acquisition. So the reason was it was easier. Uh, it was easier than you felt the right move, especially in a move where, you know, we, we are going after that, you know, simplifying payments for everyone um, in the Western world. And so, you know, the more markets you have, the, the less space you let to your competition, of course, right? Uh, and, and the more, you know, you, you can, uh, you can start building a, um, you know, a global corporation, which is very important payments because payments is mostly all about volume. The more volume, the less you pay. And, and so the more profit you can make or, or, or the lower the pricing you can offer, uh, which helps you get, have more growth, uh, which was more to play at the time. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about that growth play. Um, you mentioned that you raised a hundred million dollars and the VCs were like, go spend it do it in two years. <laughs> then we have the tech crisis. We've got all these things going on. How did, you know, how did that affect the way that you thought about strategy as a CPO and, and what you did prior to the tech crisis and, and what happened afterwards? Yeah. So, so, I mean, before I had essentially two jobs, uh, one job is the organizational part of the CPO, which is just make a scale give us a product that we can onboard as fast as possible in as many countries as possible uh, that is easy to understand by any new salesperson uh, we've hired and easy to install by any new ops person and everything and build enough, you know, it's, you know, it's big enough and autonomous enough so that they can, you know, like you can have 25 PMs working at the same time and without, you know, stepping on each other's too. So, you know, that was one one big part of the job. Uh, and, still, and the other part was, Okay, what next? What next? What next? What next? So, so in, unfortunately, you lose a bit of focus because, you know, you're trying so many things because the only thing in the end you're lacking is time. You're not lacking in money and you're not lacking in resources. You're lacking time. Like that's the, the number one thing you're lacking. Um, so, so, you know, that's my job is coordinating, like, what are the topics we're, we're trying? What are new topics we're trying? How do we get good enough on the t topics we've already validated? And, and then how do we scale our organization as a whole? Um, after the tech crisis, so we unfortunately had to, to, to massively downscale because, you know, like as most startups in our, in such a growth phase, we were never set up, uh, to actually like, uh, be profitable anytime soon. Uh, and so we had to downscale. Um, and once we did that, the job, you know, of course the downscaling part was really tough and, and, and really hard. Um, and, but after that. I would say the, the, the product job at least became even more interesting. The reason for it is it's cool to do a product that scales. I think it's even funnier to do a product that is that good, that people want to pay a lot of money for it, that you can be profitable, right? And, and so, so the job became very different is how do I make a product that people really want? And, and, and this is tough because when you're told, when you're inventing something new, there's no margin. 
there's no market. Like people, you, you go to someone, you're like, you need that. It's like, no, I don't need that. And once you've conv convinced them you need that, then you will tell them, no, it costs that much. And just like, no way, it costs that much. It should cost so much or nothing or whatever. You should give it for, to me for free. Or, and, and so you're always fighting uphill battles everywhere. And, and so your product needs to be absolutely excellent and providing a ton of value. And, and you know, one of the things we, we, we struggled at the beginning for, for one of the things we identified is when we started thinking about profitability was, you know, we were seeing all the data points that we were providing a ton of value to everyone in the restaurant ecosystem, to the, to the consumer, because they're saving time and having nice, nicer experience, to the waiter, because they're making a lot more tips, um, and to the restaurant owner, because they're rotating their table faster and, and you know, especially making, making more profits on their restaurants. And, and, you know, we had hard data showing, you know, validating this hypothesis and, and, you know, that was fantastic. But it's one thing to see that you have value and that uh, you, you see that you provide value to people and to convince people that they're getting value, especially like on, on you know, when you think of the, of the waiters, like waiters are, are often, uh, you know, people that are doing that for two, three years before doing another job. Uh, they might not be as committed as, uh, you know, we might think, for example, a, a, SaaS, a SaaS employee, you know, a PM, a new PM in a company, like they might not be as committed to that job. And, and they're not, you know, they might not be as analytical. So when you tell them you make more tips, uh, I'll give you a simple story. Like I, I went to a restaurant once and, and uh, not more than once, obviously, but <laughs> I went to one of them. <laughs> and then I figured out, I was like, oh, that's a cool business we do. <laughs> no. Um, and so went to a restaurant, a uh, customer of ours and, and talked to, you know, the, to talk to a few waiters. And at some point I talked to one waiter and, and, and she told me, yeah, I don't make more tips for Sunday. That's like, that's just not true. And I was like, oh really? And, uh, and she's like, I was like, well, why do you say that? And, and she's like, well, last week I got, keep in mind, these are French numbers, right? Not us numbers, but I got 20 euros of tips, uh, with Sunday and I got 80 euros of tips uh, with cash and terminal payments. And I was like, yeah, okay, but when I look at the data, you had 95% of your tables paying with cash or terminal payment. So if you had paid, made every table paid uh, with Sunday, you would probably not have got 100 euros of tips, but 400 euros of tips. And then she was like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, but, but the thing is, she looked just at the nominal value, right? Because she was not an analytical person. That's not her job. That's not what we ask of her, right? So she was just saying she gets less tip with Sunday. But the thing is, she had almost no table paying with Sunday. So of course she gets less tip with Sunday. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's not enough to generate more tips, but you have to tell them how much they're going to get, how much more they're going to get. And, and, and to do that, it feels easy, but it's not easy. It's not easy because... First, you have to tell it in a simple enough message. And second, you need to reach to, to these people. And they are not your employees. The waiters are not, you know, Sunday's employees. They are the employees of the restaurant. And again, we mentioned they have high turnover and everything. So you have a ton of problems to solve before you can convince every single waiter that is, you know, has Sunday in their restaurant to actually push for a solution and actually like actively, um, actively pitch it to customers. So, so. It's, uh, you know, these are, it's not enough to produce value. You have to show it as well. That's a really good lesson, I think, for people out there listening. Uh, to me, if you can't show what you get from a product, it's really hard for the people who support the product to actually demonstrate values to people who have the budget and for people to keep using it, right, if they don't understand those things. So I always think that's like a great, great piece to actually concentrate on in product management. You were talking a little bit, too, about how your objective went from growth at all costs, right, to profitability. How did that affect your strategy? And what should people who are, you know, CPOs who are leading teams now in this like post zero interest rate world um, start to think about when it comes to profitability versus growth or, or how they should be considering their strategies that way? Um, I would say... The number one thing we did is reduce the amount of things we were going to try um, and reduce the amount of countries we were going to be in and trying to actually like really focus on the countries that had, you know, that were digital savvy. And so we would see essentially digital savvy would bring high adoption in restaurants. Once you're in there, people use you. Then, then you know, big enough restaurants so that, you know, once you sell, uh, once you sell to them, you make enough money and you have enough volume to make money and slow, like, lower 
uh, or smaller sales cycle. Uh, so, you know, not only you can acquire them at a cheaper cost, but you can acquire them fast and you can build on, you can build momentum there. So I'd say that was the number one thing is, you know, refocus on the countries where, you know, we know we have market fit, um, market fit as in not only market fit as in are people willing to use it, but market fit as in we are able to make money in a relatively, um, close timeframe. Uh, so that would be the, that would be the first thing. Then the second thing is again, so reduce the amount of products we try and, and be a lot more conservative, uh, about it. And then moving away from an MVP focused on how much time we spend on things and going to an MVP of how much, how much money may we make out of this? Like if we build this out of our user base, who, who's going to take it? Like, or are we going to increase our user base? Yes, no. Right. And then within our user base, who's going to take it? And then, you know, who, who's potentially going to, going to, going to buy that. And then how do we validate that? Right. And so, yeah, for example, when Sunday built the review product, it, it was absolutely wonderful. I mean, I had, uh, so essentially like at the end of the payment experience, you could just essentially rate, uh, rate, uh, the restaurant and the review will be posted on, on, on Google maps. Um, and, and this thing essentially multiplies by five, the number of cool ratings you get as a restaurant, which is absolutely insane for two reasons. Number one is. Most of your ratings you get are from haters, uh, people who are not happy, who's going to, you know, they're, they're going to rate you bad. And, and so, so, so your reviews are sensitively, sensitively lower than what they should actually be, uh, on, on Google maps. And here we're just offering it to every single person that is paying. Right. And then the process is much, much more seamless. So you're, you're, you're reducing that bias of, you know, more haters are coming to, to, to rate you on Google than, than, than normal, like just, you know, any, any customers you may have. So that's number one thing. The second thing, so you increase your average rating. The second thing is um, number of ratings. What most people don't know is number of ratings is not only a sign of you know like strength or, or reliability in the rating, but it's the equivalent of SEO on Google Maps. The more ratings you have, the more recent ratings you have, uh, the more traffic and uh, essentially you have on Google Maps. And so the more you're going to appear, even on a, on a, on a, you know a higher view. Like if you're if you're looking at the whole city, you're going to see only a few restaurants. These are the restaurants that. Either pay for it, of course, or or you know have the most ratings, and so suddenly you bring a ton more visibility and a ton more you know um, uh, a lot of better ratings with that product. And and so I went to the US, I think three weeks after launching that product, and visited one of our most successful restaurants, um, which had like close to 85, 90 percent adoption um, before even having the review product. And when I met with the owner, which was obviously complete before the review product. The guy just talked to me about the review product for 45 minutes because he was that excited. And I was like, all right, that's a sign that even from a guy that loved the product before, now he's only talking about reviews. And so he would literally buy, he would buy that at three times the price and he would still be super happy and it still worth the money for him. And so, you know, bottom line is this is what we focused on. We wanted to, to, to see these signs and, you know, can we sell that if we sell it? What do people buy it right now? Uh, do people say, ah, oh, yeah, maybe, or I want to try or. You know, what can we show? Can we easily show value as well? Like reviews is a topic where it's very easy to show value. Uh, loyalty, for example, is a topic where it's harder to show value because loyalty builds up on the other time, right? So, so to show value to people is much harder. So you can sell to people who know want, who they, who want a loyalty program right now and they want a turnkey solution. Uh, you know, you can do that because, you know, we're integrating the payment system and whatnot, but you can only sell to the people who want one right now. You can't sell to the people who are not looking for one. Review. Everyone knows Google reviews. Most waiters, most general managers are incentivized on the reviews they get, uh, you know, online. And so, and so that was a, you know, typical, typical case of a product where, you know, we, we thought differently about the MVP. We were focused on, you know, how can we, you know, can we sell that and can, can, can we really sell that? And that was a, a very clear, clear cut um, case. You know, what's funny about all this? I'm a, I'm building a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> no, are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so my cool. sister and I. Yeah, we're, uh, we're opening it in our town. Uh, it's but, the only place I've lived where I was like, I could do this. I'm not. I'm not going to run it. She's going to run it. She's a restaurant person. But wow. my entire family is in restaurants except me. Wonderful. What kind of restaurant? It's going to be a upscale cocktail bar, small plates. Ah, uh, wonderful. So, yeah. So if you come to Bluffton, South Carolina, which is in the middle of nowhere, it will be here. <laughs> 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 we'll so look cool. into using Sunday. <laughs> oh, wonderful! I, I I love I love the restaurant industry. I mean, like I think it's such a wonderful business, and uh, 
it's it's so these are some of the best times uh, and these are uh, like i've had in my life and, and you can have that literally every week <laughs> so it's, it's uh, i love it but it's a tough business it's a tough business it's long hours it's early wake up tough in management tough in everything like <laughs> Oh, yeah, we know what we're getting into. It's funny because everybody's like, do you know what you're getting into? And I was like, I grew up with parents who owned restaurants. My sister has always worked in restaurants. Like, I know more than I want to know. <laughs> um, but but I, will, I will be you don't I'm hoping be, getting off the ground. You're not that naive, but, uh, but you know, sometimes being a bit naive helps as well. Like <laughs> Exactly, but I'm excited. And I think, yeah, being a little naive and being like, it's going to be great. You know, you just have to, you have to be super optimistic. And I yeah. think I think we're very optimistic, and I know my sister is very good at running restaurants. So yeah. I'm I trust you to do that. Wonderful. So, well, this was great. Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, for coming on and telling us all about your journey. If people want to learn more about you, where can they go? Uh, LinkedIn. I'm not a very vocal person. I don't have a blog or a website or anything. LinkedIn is great. <laughs> okay, great. And we will definitely post the links uh, so they can find Alex on our show notes. So if you go to productthinkingpodcast.com, we'll have all of his details there. Thank you so much for listening to the Product Thinking Podcast. We'll be back next Wednesday with another fantastic guest. And remember that if you have any product management questions for me, you can submit them to dearmelissa.com. That way I can answer them on a future episode. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.